Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty, along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal. I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. I'm your co-host, Debbie Cox Bolton. In this episode, I speak with California Senator Ben Allen, who co-chairs the Environmental Caucus in the legislature and chairs the Senate Environmental Quality Committee. We talked about his groundbreaking plastic pollution bill, which was signed into law by Governor Newsom earlier this summer, including how he built broad bipartisan support for the bill. We also talked about his efforts around election reform, the importance of local journalism, why compromise is not a dirty word, and what it's like to represent Hollywood. I hope you enjoy. Senator Ben Allen, welcome to an honorable profession. It's so nice to be here, Debbie. Really happy to have you, a fellow Californian, just down the road from me, super exciting, <laughs> excited about that always. And as I mentioned in the intro, you know, you are the co-chair of the Legislative Environmental Caucus. You co-chair or you chair the Senate Environmental Quality Committee. And I wanted to kind of start maybe with a, co- a question to you about some really exciting things that happened here earlier this summer. Our Governor Newsom signed your landmark plastic pollution bill, which has really been called, in my reading of it, the most comprehensive measure in the nation to address the plastic waste crisis. So I think maybe just starting with what's in it and what are what is it going to do? So our whole recycling system is has been in a free fall since the Chinese decided to implement what's called the national sword policy, where we, we used to send so much of our recycling off to, to China. And of course, it turned out that so much of that material was getting incinerated, you know, thrown into rivers and all the rest. Basically, this bill has now is, is now shifting the responsibility associated with plastic pollution to the people who have the most tools in their disposal to do something about it, the producers, the people who keep pushing plastics out into our marketplace. Right now, local governments and ultimately ratepayers, regular folks, are paying the cost associated with all of this extra plastic pollution that's out there. They're paying the cost through increased rates, through more litter cleanup, all these resources that used to actually, gen- all these resources that are now sucking money from local ratepayers and local governments going to address, to put additional band-aids on top of this plastic pollution waste crisis. So we said, enough is enough. We've got to put in place some standards. We've got to say to the producers, you got to reduce the amount of plastic, of unnecessary plastic that you're putting out in the market in general. And we also have to put in place aggressive rates with dates associated with those rates on recyclability and and compostability. So we ultimately want to phase out non-recyclable, non-compostable single-use plastics. It's all about trying to build a market for alternatives, trying to ensure that that industry is looking for more environmentally sustainable alternatives to the current products and packaging that they're putting out on the market. And the best kind of corollary to this is to think back to Los Angeles in the 1970s. You know, you live just up the road from us. Back when I was born in LA, you know, kids growing up in South Central LA were growing up with half of the lung capacity of kids growing up in rural parts of the country because of how bad the air quality was. The smog levels were that bad. And ultimately, the government said, enough is enough. We've got to solve this problem. And they said to the automobile industry, look, guys, you, you got to up your game. We've got to have you know, cleaner burning cars. And a lot of the car companies hemmed and hawed. They didn't want to do it. But it, what's interesting is there were many of them that actually had been doing a lot of research and development in this space. They knew the technology was there. It was a matter of scaling. It was a matter of pushing the issue, incentivizing the scaling. And in the end of the day, those companies were able to benefit <laughs> from these new laws. We don't have, I mean, all you got to do is get into your car at 5 p.m. on a weekday in L.A. And, you know, we got many more cars on the road than we did back in the 70s. But the air is significantly cleaner. So by pushing for these stricter standards, we were able to dramatically increase air quality, not just in the L.A. area, not just around the state of California, but indeed around the world, because 
when California makes a rule change like this, it impacts global supply chain and, and, and manufacturing and markets. You know, the automobile industry shifted toward cleaner burning cars. And there's not fewer cars. It's just that they're, 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 they're cleaner burning. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying to the pr- plastics manufacturers, look, guys, you got to have more sustainable products. You got you to gotta be thinking about the end use of your product. There was a recent kind of detergent bottle manufacturer that just changed the resin type of their detergent bottle. And in that one decision, I think it was made for aesthetic reasons, rendered the item totally non-recyclable. It used to be fully recyclable. Now it is non-recyclable. Now it's headed straight to the landfill. And we're all paying the cost associated with that. And that's because they had no accountability, no, literally, literally no responsibility associated with the end use of their product. Under our bill, they will now be held accountable, not just for technical recyclability, but real recyclability. They will be held accountable to real aggressive recycling rates that they will have to meet. Yeah. I think, first of all, on your first point, like, I, I don't think people realize what a mess the recycle, I mean, this recycling system is, right? Like, we, I think, you know, there's even been behavioral changes about, you know, with the recycle bins and all it was wonderful things. But like, I don't think people realize like what happens to those and this whole new relationship with China is like, it's not what's what we think is happening is not happening to your point, right? I mean, that's it's fascinating. <laughs> You know, people just, they put their their trash out in the bin. They put their recycling in the bin. If there is recycling, I mean, some states don't have recycling and it just magically disappears and they never think about it again. And what we've actually been doing is doing everyone a disservice by, because they don't realize that at the end of the day, so you, people would be shocked if they knew how little of the items that end up in their blue bin actually end up getting recycled. I mean, I'll give you an example. I used to, I was, I'm in LA, I love the newspaper, right? LA Times, for whatever reason, continues to show up at my doorstep in a bag. I mean, it never rains in LA. I don't know why they have to put the bag. <laughs> there, there was a recycling symbol on that bag. I would always dutifully put it in my recycling bin because I thought, oh, it's recyclable. It has a recycling symbol. We should, you know, we should recycle it. Well, it turns out I actually was harming the system by doing that because that thin film never gets recycled. And in fact, if anything, all it does is it gets caught in all the paper bales mm-hmm. and actually diminishes the caliber and the quality of the paper. Mm. It makes it harder for the paper to get recycled because now this plastic is now stuck into the paper, which lowers the quality of, uh, you know, and when it gets to the um, the paper mills, it's harder for them to do their work, to break down the paper and turn it into the next round of paper. And so we we basically, we, we're now, we, we'd put all the responsibility and the onus on the consumers, the residents and, and the local governments. We are now getting the producers involved. Yeah, yeah. We're now saying to the producers, look, guys, work with us here. You got to be part of the solution. You're the ones with the most tools at your disposal when it comes to the design and manufacture and makeup of your products. You've got to be part of the solution. We're going to make you be part of the solution, but we're also going to give you an opportunity to take a leadership role. We're actually giving the businesses a leadership role in, in leading these producer responsibility organizations. They will be leading these organizations because they know their products best. They will be held strictly accountable to the rates and dates that I was talking about earlier. But but it's going to be a business led operation with government holding them accountable. Yeah, well, and I want I'm glad you said because I wanted to mention that because it, I thought one of the most interesting things about this bill was that you did get the business community on board as partners. This was a long process. People may not know out here about our California initiative process, which is you know a lot of things can get on the ballot. There was a, as I understand, a recycling initiative headed to the ballot that you were able to by brokering this deal before that got pulled off. So talk to us just a little bit about the process and particularly how you got business to be such a key player and um, as you said, leader in this. That was one of the main really heartening things about this effort that it, it ultimately really was a group effort that brought the Chamber of Commerce together with environmental leaders, uh, local government, environmental justice, and so many different voices within the business community. And ultimately, it was a bipartisan uh, vote. Not you know, not every member voted for it, but we had Republicans and Democrats in both houses vote for this. So we do have a ballot measure system. Uh, it's it's notorious around the nation. But one thing we did as a legislature a few years ago was really important. We created a mechanism whereby the proponents of a ballot measure could pull back the ballot measure before a certain date if the legislature took action to address whatever issue they were trying to address. I think we can all agree that it's almost always better for the legislature to act rather than than, than the voters. First of all, the voters would you know, say to us over and over again, why do you have so many things on the ballot? It's your job to solve these tough policy issues. That's why I elect you to go to the legislature. It's the legislature that has the, the staffing, the expertise, the, the committee processes. 
we're better set up to pass laws. And by the way, once we pass a law, we can always amend it in the future if there's a problem with the law. One of the problems with the ballot measures is that they pass, they're very hard to amend. So that's one aspect of it. The other thing about a ballot measure is that it's expensive, it's unpredictable. It ends up costing so much money. And I think one of the things that happened was that people didn't want to roll the dice. So there was a, we had tried to, to make progress on this issue for several years. I'd had a, an earlier version of this bill four years ago and then three years ago. And we had came excruciatingly close to getting very strong legislation passed through the legislature, but we, we weren't able to get it across the finish line at the end of session uh, two years in a row. Ultimately, a group of, of folks on the environmental side said, hey, we want to, the legislature's not acting. We want to use the initiative process to force this issue. And they collected signatures and got a measure to qualify for the ballot. And that then started the negotiation in a very real way. Business said, hey, we know we can probably defeat this ballot measure if we spend $100 million trashing it. But we also know, A, that's a lot of money. B, this issue is not going away. We're going to be back at square one working on a solution next year. What if we could figure out a way to come up with a solution, strike a deal with the environmental community that takes the cost and unpredictability of the ballot measure off of the ballot and codifies strong, meaningful legislation. And we started months long negotiations. It was a nine month negotiation. It was wild. It involved you know, representatives from, from so many different stakeholder groups. We came out with a, a after a, a long fought, uh, but, but ultimately well-negotiated deal. And then that got sent out into the, into the broader world. And then everyone started kind of jumping in with their own ideas. And that went on for a few weeks and month, you know, about a month. And, you know, I tell you, Debbie, this this bill almost died about nine times. I mean, there were times I got home, I told my wife, you know, this thing's over. It happened over and over again. And we just kept trying, we just kept snatching victory out of the jaws of defeat and, and just never gave up and ultimately pushed this thing through. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately it really was the product of a, of a big multi-stakeholder effort. And, and, and in the end of the day, we were able to get this thing passed with strong, you know, bipartisan support, which is so, so heartening in a moment like this, where there's so much polarization. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's a huge, a huge effort. And I, but it's also is isn't that what's legislation and making laws is supposed to look like? I mean, I kind of feel like we've gotten out of this. You know, it's like you compromise. This is something I, I wanted to ask you about because I think you're known for your ability to broker deals and and strike compromise actually, and and in other things, in environmental efforts other other before this. And I kind of feel like it's somehow become a dirty word, right? That like compromise is somehow like that's what that's what governing looks like, isn't it? It's like you bring stakeholders together, people have different ideas, you you find the common ground. Like that's not a dirty word. That's and I for somehow like we've become such so dogmatic on both sides about, you know, if it's it's my way or the highway. And I guess I wonder, I wish more people realize that this is this is what it's supposed to look like. Absolutely. And, and I will say, Deb, you know, my, my, my favorite class in law school was negotiations. And the thing that I learned, the thing that really sticks with me, and, and anybody who studies negotiations knows this, in the end of the day, people may be, may be seemingly at odds. They may be fighting each other. And it may seem that there's just no area of agreement. But in the end of the day, usually on something like this, like a tough policy issue, one group has one set of interests and the other has another set of interests. And there's actually a way to square them. I mean, sometimes there isn't, but so often the core interests are actually on different topics. Mm -hmm. And if you can, if you really have the time and the inclination and the motivation and the, the app and the context to try to find a deal, and those are all big ifs, but if you really do have all of those factors at play, then you really, then, then, then so often on these meaty, difficult public policy issues, you can come up with a, a solution that doesn't ultimately ask people to compromise their core needs. Mm -hmm. And so in a weird way, people say compromise is a dirty word because I think it, it suggests that you are giving in on something that's fundamental to you and your beliefs. A really well-negotiated policy solution should be grounded in meeting as many as as everyone's needs as core needs as 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 much as you possibly can and sometimes it's e it's much easier to do that than than might initially meet the eye but it takes time and will and, and volition yeah well and not to belabor this but it just feels to me and maybe you have thought on this that sometimes particularly in legislatures right either state legislatures or in congress as a whole a little bit different on local level when you have to you know, deliver that it almost feels like the incentives are there to find a position and dig in less. So the incentives to find the compromise. And I, you know, I wonder if that's, 
you know, if you see that that way or, you know, why or why you think you think differently that, you know, you're looking for the for the result. First of all, I think you're unfortunately you're absolutely right, Debbie. This is the this is the result. I mean, it didn't used to be that way in Congress. Right. I mean, I I, I read. You know, that that incredible Joseph Caro book about LBJ. I mean, books. <laughs> it goes on forever, but but it's just chock full. And there's that one, um, the the one volume about his work in Congress, just chock full of fascinating stories of of deals. And 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 if you look at the things he was able to accomplish with all the great society legislation and the civil rights legislation, it's extraordinary. And it really did involve careful, relentless listening and negotiating and not giving up and trying to find ways to meet everybody's needs that used to be the bread and butter of of working congress you know unfortunately as you as you correctly identify uh, we we've moved so far away from that model and now it's all about fighting each other over over social media and, and trying to score points with the press and you know i i got to say i think in in the i mean the, the great thing about working in the legislature is that <laughs> We don't get a lot of press attention. It's a, it's a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a bad thing because I think actually there's a lot of really interesting things happening in the legislature. And I actually think that that the people of the state of California really do deserve to know more about what's going on and weigh in and have ideas and thoughts about what's going on in Sacramento. I mean, the number of correspondents that used to be here has really plummeted since the 60s up here in Sacramento. The flip side is because there's not that much press attention, the, legis- the, the legislators are not as inclined to spend all their time trying to score, you know, points on on social media because you can't really score a lot of points because there're not that many people paying attention. The downside of the people not paying attention is that I think special interests end up coming to dominate more than they should. Yeah. Special interests take advantage of the vacuum when it comes to attention and it's all about advancing their agenda and and that can become a real problem. Yeah. And you 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 tried to do something about this on the transparency front in I in have. terms of you you were trying to help support local journalism, right? For this very reason, presumably. Local journalism. Yeah, we, we I, I mean, I, I you know, I, my, my dad is British. I spent a lot of time in the UK. I, I just was in Canada, actually, on a trip relating to extended producer responsibility and plastics and waste management. And you go to, you, you watch the CBC and up in Canada, the BBC in Britain, and you just look at this wonderful publicly financed uh, journalism that really, really adds the, the strength of their democracy. Having independent, well-financed, high-quality journalism actually, and you'll notice it raises the bar of all of the private journalism sources too, mm. and, and leads to a much higher caliber conversation in, in the country about politics. So that's one thing. I also, you know, I'm very interested in clean money efforts. I'm interested in greater transparency efforts, you know, trying to create more disclosure as to who's financing campaigns, who's paying for all the, the mailers that you get in the mail attacking a ballot measure or supporting a ballot measure or attacking a candidate, supporting a candidate, all of that stuff. I mean, there's there's limits to what we can do because of Citizens United and some other jurisprudence. And quite frankly, there are limits to what we can do in the legislature because of the power of special interests. But I'm I'm never going to stop being a believer in, in those sorts of, of efforts that, that, that try to shine more light. You know, on, on the independent journalism question, there was a recent study done. Listen to this, Debbie. In those towns that have a local newspaper, they pay lower a lower borrowing rate for their bonds, their school bonds and their municipal bonds. It's it is literally they have a they get a lower rate in the market because the market recognizes that when there is a robust local journalism infrastructure, there it's it's less likely that people will be on the take. It's more likely that there will be journalists, reporters asking tough questions, and the local elected officials will have to step up and learn a little bit more and ask questions themselves and hold their own administrators accountable. That's so valuable that it actually is reflected in the borrowing rate for these bonds. So people living in communities that don't have local strong local journalism are paying in, in ways that they may not even realize. That's fascinating. Yeah. I've never heard that before. That's that's super interesting. It seems like that should be more well known, <laughs> actually. NPR did a whole piece on it, and I can get you the information. I love. I mean, New Deal should publicize this because it's a. It does speak to. I mean, we we local journalism, journalism in general in the United States has been suffering tremendously, but local journalism especially. And you know, I, my, my wife's from Youngstown, Ohio, and you know, the Vindicator, this wonderful newspaper that used to run for years. I mean, it, it got it shut down. I mean, it was now bought by another in, uh, another outlet, and they're, they're they're trying to get it re up again. But there's so many of these stories. Yeah, absolutely. Of really you know, respected newspapers that have folded left and right, or even if they're still alive, they've dramatically reduced their 
their staffing and their and their journalists. And, and those journalists, they are the ones out there spending the late nights at the city council meetings, asking those tough questions, holding people accountable. And all that stuff really matters when it comes to, to governance and government services. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to make sure I've, I've got time to ask you about another initiative that you were that you championed a few years ago because we saw the outcomes of it in 2020 here in California. And that was a big effort you had around election reform and trying to make it the process easier for people to vote. And it just seems so timely. I should mention, you may know, Ben, that we um, launched a democracy working group recently that where we're going to be looking at best practices at state local level on democracy and how to make it easier to vote, also make sure election integrity, also think about civic engagement. But so um, tell us a little bit about your initiative back in 2016 and, and how it played out in, uh, in 2020. Well, Debbie, I'd love to be a part of that group. And, and, and Rodell's now doing a, a part of a working group on redistricting. So let's let's talk offline about that. But great. Yeah, we passed SB 450 a few years ago. We were coming off of, of, of the lowest turnout in, in modern history in the 2014 election, dismally low turnout. And the pro tem, I had just been elected to the Senate, and the pro tem, the president of our Senate, asked me to go and investigate best practices around the country to make it easier to vote while still maintaining strong election integrity. And we ended up spending a lot of time in Colorado. And I want to give, I do want to tip my hat to our fellow, Col- our, our friends in Colorado who just welcomed us to the state. We traveled around uh, uh, and, and learned about the model, and we ended up adopting a model that suited our needs, but was was kind of largely based on theirs. Now in California, as a result of our efforts, everybody sent a ballot by mail, and people have the option of either returning that ballot by mail, or they can go to a drop box, which is available. The drop boxes are available all over the state. So if, if they're nervous about dropping in the mailbox, these are drop boxes that are only accessed by election officials, or they can go drop off their ballot or vote in person at an election center, a voting center that's open for 11 days before election day, anywhere in their county. So the idea that you can only vote in one place at one time, in in one location on one day, is so antiquated for for modern life. And and now we give people the option of of flexibility. And it's just, it's been wonderful. I mean, I I was, I I personally benefited from it, right? I I was with my wife, we went and saw a show downtown LA and it turns out there was a vote center right across the street and and, over the weekend and the election was on Tuesday. So let's go vote right now. We just went over and voted, easy. It wasn't wasn't close to my house, but it was where we were. It was very convenient. By the way, everyone's ballots are tracked, you know, including with signature. And 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 so people can be let know if if their if their ballot wasn't uh, they can track their ballot. They can make sure their ballot was counted. Everything is is also uh, lined up against each other. So if, if you know in the very very rare case that someone tries to vote twice, they immediately identify and get it rectified. So all the kind of election fears that are out there are, are addressed under our system. And it's led you know it's one of many factors, but it's certainly I think a significant factor that's led to significant increase in voter turnout. It's just crazy. That we, we we should we should be making it easier for people to participate. In the end of the day, the robustness, the strength of our democracy really does depend on people's participation, on the on the idea that this is this is a, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And that that really does depend on the citizens' ability to to vote. Why are we making it harder for people to vote as long as we can have credibility to the results. It's got, from my perspective, it should be government's job to make it easier for people to vote. Uh, totally. And but I don't feel like there's been a the the kind of backlash to some of the reforms that you just talked about here in California. You can correct me if that's wrong. But are you surprised about like I'm I mean I still I know where we are where we are, but like I'm still shocked. Like people were voting absentee and by mail for you know decades in some places, no problems. Why all of a sudden this has become such a political issue just kind of baffles me. I don't know if you have any insight on that, but it's just it's it's wild. <laughs> and the funny thing is that traditionally you it was the Republicans who always voted by mail. The really interesting thing about watching election returns now is that now, now, you know, in fact, during the, 20, the 2020 election, right, there was the, the red mirage, right? The right. idea that Republicans looked like they were doing better when the, partly because, and this is interesting, in California, some states, they, they purposefully count the early ballots later. And some of it is for, for partisan reasons, unfortunately, mm. because it, it kind of creates this sense that, that the, the electorate is somewhere when it, where it actually is somewhere else. But this is a Trump thing. This is a Trump thing. I mean, he. This is all part of his chaos, his chaotic, his, his chaos-based approach to, to politics and 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 electioneering. He just wanted to throw as many monkey wrenches in the system as possible, seed as much doubt as he possibly could to build up this narrative 
that it was all a fraud. It was all a hoax. And of course, he was building up the same narrative in 2016, I think, anticipating he would lose. And he's just doubled down on the approach. And unfortunately, as you and I were discussing before we, we, we started recording, the Republican Party has become so dominated by his narrative. And in the end of the day, this is one of the many aspects of one of the many examples of the damage that he's done to the, the confidence that Americans have in our in our election system, in fact, in our entire democracy. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's wild. And by the way, it's in some respects, it's actually worked to the Republican Party's disadvantage because I think you saw that in, in Georgia. So many people thought, oh, well, this is going to be a, a, a fraud that that it actually depressed Republican turnout in certain areas and, and left the door open for uh, for the Democrats to win in those Senate races. So it's just ridiculous. It's just so ridiculous. And it, you know, it's part of the, the struggle we all have as Americans who believe in basic democratic norms right now, uh, you know, dealing with the fact that, that such a significant portion of this you know, once very honorable party seems to have gone down this, this rabbit hole. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and maybe I could use that as a great transition. You're so passionate about public service, about legislating, obviously. You're finding results. Like, so, you know, as we think about your own journey into public service, this is, of course, called an honorable profession because uh, we think that public service is, you know, one of the most honorable professions out there. You went to school at Harvard. I think you were at Cambridge for a while, and then you got your law degree. But you, I, I saw, I think right after, I, I don't know whether it's between law school or not, or, or after undergrad or whatever, but you ended up on Capitol Hill working on Capitol Hill. So that does indicate to me, maybe you had a, you had an interest in government from the beginning, but was, did you kind of ever, is that what you wanted to do? Did you see yourself in public running for office or did that kind of happen accidentally? I think I saw myself in public life. I don't know that I, I think running for office was a little, it was like a scary proposition. And, I, and in some respects, I, I, I think I had a bit of a love hate relationship with the idea of running for public office. Obviously there was a part of me that found it really compelling and attractive another part of me that was just really nervous about putting myself forward and, and all that that would mean and having to draw upon all of my friends and family and, and rely on all these people to step forward for me, the fundraising and the, just the, the, you know, the, the extent to which you have to build an operation. And, and it really is so personal. I mean, you have to put yourself on the line in such a, in such a real way. And, and you opens, opens yourself up to attacks and criticism and vilification but that being said, I love I love public life. I love the issues we get to deal with. And I, I really enjoy the job. I mean, part of what makes it so fascinating is, is just the the fact that you can work on real problems, you know, try to put your skills, both analytical and interpersonal, to bear to try to address real issues. I love the the range of issues you get to deal with when when you when you serve in public office. I mean, very few people get to work on such an incredible range of issues. Maybe teachers, journalists, but most people, you know, they, 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 they pick one thing to do and they get really good at it. And that's a wonderful thing. We need specialists, especially in this ever complex and diversified economy. But, but to be able to, every day is, is I'm just learning so many new things every single day. I, I'm eight years into this job and I'm still learning so much about our energy system and our schools and how do we, you know, finance parks and insurance reform and public safety and judicial branch issues. I mean, just the list goes on and on of issues you have to deal with on a daily basis. It's fascinating and, and meaningful. And, and so, I, you know, from my perspective, I, I guess, yeah, I, I it was interesting. I, I, I'd run. So coming out of my experience in Washington, I went to law school. I was very, I, I, I didn't know whether I wanted to go to law school. I ended up applying in the aftermath of the defeat of John Kerry, actually, in 2004. I was in some small town in Pennsylvania, having you know, gotten up at four in the morning on, uh, you know, doing doing uh, GOTV efforts for, uh, for you know, it, was a, it was a combined campaign, congressional and the Kerry campaign. And it was just so depressing. I mean, the idea that the American people had sort of seen the George W. Bush administration and, and decided to double down on that approach. And there was much less ambiguity in 20, 2004 than there had been in 2000, as we all remember. And so I thought, okay, I guess I just, let me take the LSAT. I'll, I'll, I'll apply to law school. And, I, you know, and I just, I got, I applied to law schools. I put my applications in the corner when they came in. I just, I didn't really want to face the decision, but ultimately I decided to go. But I think the fact that I struggled so much with the decision was a good thing because it really forced me to, it forced me to look at my experience in law school as part of a trajectory as opposed to a clean break. A lot of people say when you go to law school, oh, what did you, you took some time off before you went to law school. And I never thought of it that way. And it actually inspired me to run. I, I ended up putting my name in the hat for the student regent position for the University of California, which was, I ended up getting that position. It was a fascinating experience serving on the board of the University of California Board of Regents. And then coming out of that, I, I ended up running for the school board back in my hometown because I got so deep and interested in education policy. 
And then at that point, when the state Senate seat opened up, I'd been serving, I, I was in my second term as a school board member, and I'd been teaching at UCLA Law School. And it just, the stars aligned. It was it, The seat opened up very late in the game. And so I had very little time to decide. And, and I just thought, let's go for this. And maybe if I had more time, you know, I would have, maybe I wouldn't have made the same decision. But, I, you know, it was, it was like late January, early February, and the primary was in June. So I figured... You know, it's only a few months out of my life. If I lose, maybe I'll teach a class about it. And, and you know, I just went all in and, and I ended up emerging victorious. It was a really tough race, got past the primary. And then you know, we have a top two system. So I was up against another Democrat, really talented person, and ended up in, the, in, the, in a runoff. Uh, it was the hardest year of my life, but ultimately emerged successful. And, and it's been great. It's, it's really, you know, not I haven't loved every moment of it, but but it's been a real, real honor to, to represent my community and, and just try to put some of my interest at skills to work to try to solve problems. It's wonderful. It's so wonderful. I warned you I was going to ask you this question, so I gave you time to think about it. But I feel like for our listeners, out, particularly outside California, you represent some very well-known communities. Uh, you represent Hollywood, Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica. So, so when you're talking about solving problems, you're you know you're doing such a great work on the state level and really impacting our whole state. So thank you as a Californian, and really, frankly, since California is such a leader on so many issues, you're really impacting the country. To be honest, so thank you for that. But going back locally for a second, is there something fun you can tell us about getting to to represent those kind of iconic communities? I do know that you're on the California Film Commission, if that's a lead in for an answer, but that's kind of unique, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, look, it's funny. Hollywood is a, was LA is a huge city with lots of, lots going on, but we are, you know, to the extent we, you know, just like I mentioned Youngstown, right? There's a steel town or, or DC, you know, is a government town. LA is, is an entertainment town. And I guess everyone focuses on the stars and, and, and going to the studios and doing their studio tours and walking Hollywood, walk of fame. And all those things are wonderful. And I've, I've had the chance to, to literally be there when they unveil a star star you know, on, on the Walk of Fame. And that's a very special experience. And there's all sorts of things like that that happen all the time when you're in a job like this. But the reality of Hollywood is it's 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 real working people who do the day-to-day work editing and doing the sound mixing and providing the food at the at the at the shoots, doing the rigging and working working behind the scenes. I mean there's this huge infrastructure of people, many of whom are really struggling on a day-to-day basis to make it work. We all we all know about the starving actors, and there's many, many of them, by the way, just really struggling to make it make it all work, you know, work in restaurants as they as they as they just try to try to break into the industry. So there's a lot of glamour to it, but there's a lot of there's a lot of grind to it too. And a lot of a lot of people, a lot of a lot of just like hardworking folks who are behind the scenes making the magic happen for everybody. And I know the world really appreciated the work of so many of my constituents during the pandemic because everyone had to, you know, they spent a lot more time watching TV, right? You know, watching those movies, watching those shows that, you know, on Netflix and Amazon Prime and everything else. I mean, certainly you get to go to some fun events and and, and meet some interesting people. But I, I, I will say that behind all of that magic that's on your on your screen, there's a lot of of really hard work and, and really good, hardworking, modest people. Yeah, that's such well, thank you for that. And thanks for the reminder of that. And in general, I just want to say, Thanks so much for being with me today and for so fun to talk to you about all this stuff and give me a lot of hope for what's some of the great things that are happening here in California that you've been a part of that we can hopefully export to other parts of the country. And just thank you for your for your service. Well, thank you, Debbie. I really I and I just I appreciate New Deal. I mean, I I'm new to the network, but it's a great network of pragmatic, thoughtful democratic leaders who are, who are coming up with really good solutions to a lot of different challenges. And I just I just look forward to, to getting more engaged and working more closely with you as, as we all try to make our country a little better. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Thank you so much, Senator. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. Mm-hmm.